So we're back into our spiritual warfare. This will be the final night when we talk about destroying arguments as far as lies. Um, there is so much more to, to deal with there, so you'll have to do your research there. Hopefully this has inspired you to dive into the Word of God and begin to be saturated so that you can destroy arguments as the enemy comes at you. We know we're in a spiritual war. It is a battle for the mind. Satan attacks one of two ways, with lies and temptation. We're going to deal with lies in a final sense today, and then next week we're going to start dealing with temptations. Um, so we're going to have to put the shield of faith so that we can put out all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Um, and so we'll begin to do that next week. We should be saturated with the Word of God. I cannot stress that enough. You know that I say that all the time, but it's vitally important. If you are not saturated with the Word of God, you cannot do like Paul says in 2 Corinthians. Oh, oh man, I almost blamed you, Dave. I almost cussed you out, buddy. Sorry, that's my bad. That's my fault. You had it up here for me anyway. You're awesome. I appreciate you. Second Corinthians 10, verse 5, Paul says that we're to destroy arguments and every lofty opinion that's raised against the knowledge of God and uh, take every thought captive uh, to obey Christ. So as I said, it's a battle for the mind. If you're not saturated with the word of God, you'll never be able to destroy arguments. Never. And so um, we destroyed salvation uh, is by works. We have destroyed thou shalt not kill. We talked about that. It should be rendered uh, thou shalt not murder. We talked about the words. Uh, we destroyed women preachers. We have destroyed four arguments from Matthew 19 on marriage and divorce and uh, gender ideology and so forth. Um, lies and false doctrine are very dangerous to the church. Let me give you a few points here before we uh, get into our uh, discussion. Let me give you three reasons why um, false doctrine is dangerous to the church. Number one, false doctrine is deceptive. False doctrine is deceptive. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14 says, And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Now, we, we seem to picture Satan as the little red guy with horns and the tail and the pitchfork and the little goat's feet, and we laugh at him and think it's funny, but that's not him, because Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So if you see a beautiful angel, that could be Satan, because he is disguised. Now, that word disguised, or uh, some translations use transform, it comes from the Greek word uh, metaskematizo. And it means to mask or disguise, and literally it is to change the outward appearance. And it's where we get our English word masquerade from. Uh, so have you ever heard of a masquerade party? You're changing your outward appearance, you're putting on a mask, you're disguising yourself. And so I think uh, the NIV actually translates this, uh, Satan masquerades himself as an angel of light. And so that's uh, this verse specifically, they do the best job of translating it. John 8, we know that Satan is a liar. He is the father of lies. He was a liar from the beginning. And so he masquerades as an angel of light telling the truth. So you've got to be careful because uh, with his false religion and his false uh, lies and his falsehood, he, you, you could get deceived unless you are saturated with the word of God. And that's why I said it's so important to do that. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9 uh, John writes, and the great dragon was thrown down, um, the ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, and here it is, he is the deceiver of the whole world. He deceives the whole world. Uh, and so we know that uh, Jesus said he is the God of this world. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 that they can't come to the understanding because uh, the God of this world has blinded their minds. He is deceiving the whole world with lies. And as we're talking about... Uh, uh, apologetics month on Sunday. That's just like evolution. He is absolutely destroying the biblical creation based off of any type of science, man's word, um, as opposed to God's word. And people believe that stuff. And so you got to be careful uh, lest you get deceived. In Genesis 3, he deceived Eve and uh, she sinned against the Lord. And so Matthew chapter 4, Satan tried to deceive Jesus himself. Not to any successful uh, way, but, and you ask the question, why is uh, false doctrine so dangerous? 
Uh, well, because it's deceptive, it's satanic, and that because it's lies, and that's uh, it comes from the father of lies. So you could say false doctrine is satanic because it comes uh, from Satan. We don't want to be led astray. False doctrine uh, is meant to distort the truth like it did with Eve and uh, thus deceiving its hearers. And if you become deceived, you will end up believing those lies as truth. And so you, you've got to be saturated with the truth so you can defend yourself against the lies. Once you become accustomed to false doctrine, it becomes very difficult to break out of it. When we talk about salvation and discipling someone, it is so easy to disciple and train somebody up who has never heard about Jesus Christ. Because everything that they are hearing is brand new. As opposed to a Roman Catholic, a Mormon, a Jehovah's Witness, because they have a distorted view of all that stuff. And it's very hard to bring them out of it. It's very hard to break that cycle of falsehood. Amen? And so it's important that you have the truth. But when somebody tries to help see that truth or help lead you back to the truth, it can become, uh, it can become challenging and very problematic with our relationships. Uh, so you got to be careful about that. Number two, uh, it's dangerous because false doctrine is deceptive, but uh, also false doctrine is divisive. Uh, it is divisive. Just as false doctrine distorts the truth, it divides as well. It can split a church in half, but it's done from within. Um, the splits are normally done from within. That is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 1, verse 10, he says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Matter of fact, in our Constitution, we have, if you wish to be a member here at Mission Point, you align with our doctrine and faith and practice because it promotes unity. We want everybody to be on the same page. Amen? So if you're not on the same page, guess what? You're going to cause division because false doctrine is very deceptive and divisive. So Paul even says in Ephesians 4, 3, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. We need to be very quick to keep that unity that the Spirit has already uh, initiated at salvation. And then even Peter says, uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, he says, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, tender heart, and a humble mind. Come together in unity to help one another out. And so this is not just... A New Testament principle, I say this is new and Old Testament all the time because the Old New Testament juke and jive. And so in the Old Testament, Psalm 133, 1, it says, A song of ascents of David, behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in what? Unity. That's right. Absolutely. This is what God wants. He wants everybody to be unified. Number three, so you have false doctrine. It's deceptive. You have false doctrine is divisive. And three, false doctrine is destructive. Now, let me, let me explain what I mean. False doctrine can end in destruction. And um, basically, God's judgment. It can end in God's judgment because false believers and false teachers are at the risk of facing God's judgment because they are not truly born again. And this is a very dangerous thing. We can't take the scripture out of context, nor can you misquote it, even if a principle is found there. Um, so when we talk about Jesus saying not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven, he's talking about false teachers. And so in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, he says, beware of false prophets, false teachers. Beware of these people that teach lies. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves. So get the context. This is what he's talking about. And so he's talking about false teachers. He's talking about these people that creep in, and then their end is destruction. And that's what he's talking about in verse 21 through 23. He says, Not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does 
the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say, Lord, Lord, didn't we not prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? We did many works in your name. And he said, I'll declare unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Mm, That's a shame. Absolute shame. And this is why James tells us this. This is a warning. A very severe warning. James chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Not many of you should become teachers, because you know that those who teach will be judged with greater strictness. When we get to heaven, that's why it's so serious to teach the truth. That's why it's so serious to be saturated with the Word of God, because if you are somebody who teaches it, you are going to be judged stricter and harsher when the judgment day comes. Amen? That's why it's important you bring people in, Sunday school, pastors, all that stuff, who are saturated with the Word of God and are preaching the truth. And if you don't know the truth, you'll never know if somebody's deceiving you from up there. It's important for everybody to be saturated with the truth. It starts at the top, it goes down to your leadership, your board, your teachers, and then it goes down from there. But everybody needs to be saturated with the Word of God. We continue to be strengthened, and it's that serious if you deceive Christ's body with false doctrine. It is that serious. That's why I tell you, and I will never stop telling you, you need to be saturated with the word of truth. Um, It is that serious. Be careful of false teachers. Paul says in Romans 16, 17, I appeal to you, brothers, watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles that are contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. What does he say? Avoid them. Stay away from them. Stay the heck away from those false teachers. They will, they will get you. They will trap you. They will trick you. They will deceive you. Um, and this is why Paul says in Ephesians 5.11, he says, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. We are to expose them instead. Expose the, the unfruitful works of darkness. Man, let everybody know that this is not biblical. This is not correct. This is not accurate. This is how you love God's people. Um, We need to be careful who you invite to church, who you bring in, who you allow to speak, who you allow to listen to in the church. We got to be careful who you listen to in your home, who you invite in in your home. You got to be careful who you listen to in your car, on your TV. You got to be careful. And this is why John says in 2 John 1, uh, verse 10 and 11, he says, if anybody comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. Don't don't do it. Don't do it at all. Um, We used to have Jehovah's Witnesses in uh, Pennsylvania. They'd come to our church all the time. And they'd be like, hey, we got boxes and boxes of our stuff for you to distribute. I said, praise God, bring them on in. We'll take them. And then we'd take them right out back when they leave and throw it right in the dumpster. He'd be like, sweet, that's six boxes that aren't going to be distributed. Praise God. <laughs> or we'd burn it if we was having a big bonfire. We had plenty of stuff to burn. Look, man, it, we're not letting that garbage get out there. You got to be careful. You got to be careful what you allow to creep in. Because as Paul said in Galatians chapter 5, verse 9, a little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump. Leavens the whole lump. You'd be surprised the power of influence, right? I mean, for good or for bad, the power of influence is, man, it's powerful. All right, open your Bibles to Psalm chapter 1. This is going to be, we're going to close here, and then we're going to take a little different turn, and we're going to move from there. You guys better talk because this is going to be, this is going to be like a short Wednesday night ever if you don't. All right, Psalm 1. This is my interpretation, um, paraphrased by me, of somebody who is saturated with the Word of God. Saturated to the point, and I'll go through this as we read it. Psalm chapter 1, the whole, it's only six verses. It says this. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Okay, 
So this guy doesn't listen to false teachers. He doesn't listen to false prophets. He doesn't listen to garbage on TV. He doesn't invite it into his home. doesn't allow it. He's saturating. He meditates on the law of God, which is the same thing as saying the word of God. He meditates on the word of God day and night. He is saturated with the word of God. And so as a result of him being saturated with God's word, look at verse 3. He shall be like a tree. Planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall, not, uh, shall prosper. This is somebody who is saturated with the word of God so much that his roots go deep. And you try to knock him over, you're going into an oak. What's the, what's the big forest with those trees that are like half a mile around or something? Whatever the, Redwood forest. Anybody ever been there? Anybody seen those? You seen those? Those are big trees, huh? I don't think you could push those over. (laughs) Um, And so, yeah, those are what I'm talking about. I I believe if I'm correct in my science, as tall as the tree is, the roots are a ball just just as wide and deep. And so this is what I mean. If you are saturated with the word of God, you're going to be like a tree that is getting fed by living water. You are right by living water and your roots are going to go deep and nothing will move you and you're going to be fruitful for the kingdom. Amen? And he goes on in verse four, the ungodly are not like that, but they are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment. They're they're not going to stand. They have no leg to stand on. They're going to be judged and burn up. They're done. They have nothing. Verse 5, therefore the ungodly shall not sin, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. God's way is going to last, and you need to follow it. Man, I I love that. That's an excellent way to say you need to be saturated with the word of God so you can be like an oak tree, absolutely unmovable, unmovable. All right, it's important to understand When we talk about false doctrine, it's important to understand the difference between false doctrine and denominational differences. Yellow, you understand what I'm saying? There's false doctrine that'll lead you to hell, and there are denominational disagreements that I will say are side issues. And these differences, they're not always due to false doctrine. They could be church policies. They could be governmental decisions. They could be styles of worship, the color of the auditorium, the color of the curtains. I've seen churches split over the color of the curtains. Amen? Come on now. (laughs) It's stupid. But people do it. (laughs) I don't know what to say. But um, some of those things are open for discussion because... The Bible doesn't directly address those issues, right? And we talked about this last week, and so I regurgitate it, bring it back up. Um, Weddings. Does the Bible say how you do weddings? No. It just says you leave your mother and father and cleave to your wife. Okay, well, what's the ceremony supposed to be like? Mm Mm-hmm. Bible doesn't say. What about funerals? This is the thing that that I really struggle with as, as a pastor, and you graduate, and you got your degree, and then somebody dies, and they're like, okay, pastor, you're doing the funeral. Oh, how do you do that? They don't train you that stuff in seminary. They don't train you how to do a wedding. They don't train you how to do a funeral. They don't train you how to do counseling. They don't train you how to do any of that stuff. All they do is they give you their opinion of the Bible and show you how to study it, and they go, there you go, pastor, move on. Okay, okay. I'm telling you, if it wasn't absolutely saturating myself with the Word of God... And aligning myself under men that just saturated me, I, I wouldn't know what the heck I'm doing. And I'm, uh, thank you, Lord, for not calling the equipped. <laughs> you equipped the called. <laughs> so I, it's taken a long time, but now I'm equipped for the ministry because of the spirit that dwells within me. And I'm thankful for that. But man, I'm telling you, sometimes you just don't know what to do. And there's a lot of differences. And so we were just. <laughs> At this funeral where a woman was the officiant. (laughs) Um, Irrelevant to me. I wasn't there for her. I wasn't listening to her doctrinal teaching. Matter of fact, it was the 
um, type of, forgive me, Catholic style type. They had the prayers that were all written out and they open the book and they read them and then they read the verse and they read this and everything's all prepared. There's, there's nothing that you come up with like I do and study and all that stuff. Uh, it's all prepared. So when you come to certain events, they have everything ready to go. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it was, it was cool. I'm like, I don't recognize you as a, well, actually she wasn't the senior pastor. She was the assistant, but the senior pastor was gone. So she was taking over. I said, I don't recognize your authority. If you don't recognize the word of God, I don't recognize you, but I'm going to sit here because I'm here for the people that I'm trying to, uh, console for the loss of their family. Not a big deal. Not an issue. Didn't get into it. Moved on. Probably won't ever go back up there except to eat in the nice restaurants. So here's the idea. You got to be careful when you're addressing people's opinions um, and neglecting false doctrine. You got to, you got to pick your battles. Be very picky about the battles you pick, right? I mean, some people, they, they, they pick battles that aren't very appropriate. And so, all right, here we go. This is going to be it. So what I want you to do is I want you to tell me if this is a false doctrine or if this is someone's opinion. And we're going to examine this from Scripture. So I hope you know the Scriptures because these are broad questions. So this goes from Genesis to Revelation. So if you need to look it up, you're more than welcome to look it up. I'll give you 30 seconds and we'll go from there. False doctrine or somebody's opinion. Okay. Children should be in the auditorium the whole time every Sunday. I say no, but that's not scripture. <laughs> that's your opinion, and I like that. That's good. Uh, this is why we're here for discussion. What does the Bible say about it? Okay, so could it be opinion? Because we are training the child up. And the parents get a little more adult-oriented stuff in here where they get child-oriented stuff back there. Okay, so how does that apply to the church? Should the kids be in here or not? Is it scriptural? Well, it would make a difference no matter where they get the information from. As long well, as someone speaks. It's scripture. True. Very true. I mean, it doesn't say that. Well, I don't know what it says. Everybody just throwing their opinion out. They're like, yeah, well, I don't yeah, think that's yeah. in the Bible, but well, I'm going to give you my well, opinion. The, Jesus tells them not to uh, deny the kids coming to him. I believe yeah. that's a scripture in there somewhere. Sure. And, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6 says that you're to train your kids up at home in the way that they should go. And that is Proverbs. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. Deuteronomy chapter 6 says when you get up, when you lie down, when you sit down, when you're eating, when you're drinking, when you're running, when you're working, every second of every day, you saturate your children with the word of God. That's the parent's job. But what about the church? What does the Bible say about the church? This is good, man. This is good. Turn to Nehemiah chapter 8. Oh, yeah. That's what I'm talking about, Daddy. It's before uh, Psalms and Proverbs, Nehemiah. It starts with an N and ends with a Maya, right? <laughs> N and Maya. And there's an E in there. E. So, Nehemiah chapter 8. Listen to this. When the seventh month came, the children of Israel were in the cities. Now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra, the high priest uh, of the law, uh, brought the law before the assembly of men and women, and all could hear with understanding. Now, who can hear with understanding? 
How big? Real young. Real young. Because those kids are smart as a whip. <laughs> very, very smart. And so everybody who can hear with understanding on the first day of the month. Then when he read from it in the open square that was in front of them in the water gate, from morning until midday, that's six hours. So you complain because I say one day I'm going to give you a two-hour message. This guy did it for six hours. And then he says, before the men and women and those who could have understanding, and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. So Ezra and the scribe and the platforms. and So after he read for six hours, look at verse 5. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. Uh, and when he opened it, all the people stood up, and Ezra blessed the Lord. And then uh, verse 8. So they read distinctly from the book of the law, and then they gave the sense and helped them understand what they were reading. So here you have the Old Testament principle where the pastor came, and matter of fact, it says there's a platform and there's a pulpit, and he stood up above and he read the law to the people. And then it said for six hours, he read the book of the law. And that says for another six hours, they went down, him and the priests and all the people uh, who were uh, experts in the law, and give explanation to the people that they were reading to. So my question would be this. Does that apply to the New Testament church? And should children be in here in the auditorium listening to the pastor because everybody who has understanding, that Old Testament law, some of that stuff's hard to understand. And anybody that has understanding, young kids, is that just opinion well, you, or is that you, scripture? You could say that if the kid, if it's not geared to, geared to their understanding, whereas if you're giving adult direction, <coughs> And the kids may not have that level of understanding, whereas they need to be taught the understanding to their age level. There you go. That's a, that's a good, that's a good one. Greg? I heard someone once say, define your terms. And so, <laughs> is the question, is it wrong to separate the children, or is the question that children should always be in the other world? Ooh, that's good. Because then, if I might have a second comment, because <laughs> Deuteronomy uh, 31, verse 12 says, Assemble the people, men, women, and little ones. So, the other. There is a biblical was, framework there. Yes, the other comment, though, was culturally speaking, not everyone had the word of God. And so they would have gathered, correct me if I'm wrong, they would have gathered in sure. such an environment because not everyone had it, so they would have gathered. They not allowed people to read. And so they would have been in that environment to, I'm not arguing one way or the other. Yeah, great. Just, <laughs> <laughs> just kind of putting that out there. But culturally, it would have been a little different. That's great. Today. Okay. Now, this is what we're doing. We're destroying arguments, right? And now what we're supposed to do? Yeah. Okay. So is it false teaching? Is it a doctrine that will lead you to hell? No. 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 Okay. So now it's opinion. Is it something that's a misconception from the scripture, or are we just misinterpreting? There's a difference now. So let's just say this. All of Israel in the Old Testament from uh, Exodus to Deuteronomy, they were to follow. That was all of Israel right there. They were all together. So everything they did, they always did it together. Now when you go to Nehemiah, who is Nehemiah and what was he doing? He was the one that went back and rebuilt the walls and the buildings and all the stuff. He didn't have all of Israel. He just had a certain amount of people mm -hmm. and their kids, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's who he's teaching. So each situation that we had, now the early church men in homes. Kids would have been in the home as well. There's nothing wrong with teaching children the scripture. But when they don't have understanding or in their capacity to understand certain things, that's the importance of mom and dad. But a lot of children don't have it from mom and dad at home. And so that's why we separate children and put them in an age-appropriate section back there, and the adults get a little more up here. Is there anything wrong with bringing all the kids in here and teaching them? Absolutely not. 
Is there anything wrong with separating those kids? Absolutely not. So which one do you do? Whatever you decide to do, right? It's some of both. I mean, on the fifth Sunday, what do we do with the kids? You're talking right. Because here's another factor. And we didn't talk about this, and it's not talking about the teaching. But it's the factor of influence. If you have to separate kids in every single school class, then they're going to be separated their whole life. Well, then I want uh, just newly graduated. I want college and career. I want young marriage. I want uh, mid-30s. I want my 40s. i, I got to have my 50s class. I'm in the 50s now, so where's my 50s class? So what happens is we separate everybody so much that when it comes to here, um, no offense, but it's the old faithful people that have been around, that know this, and they come here all the time. Because where are the kids that have graduated? Where are the college and career? Where are the young marriages in the 20s and the 30s? Right? And so it can be dangerous to separate them so much, and it can be dangerous to keep them all lumped together in one song. So that's where discernment, that's where prayer, that's where the Holy Spirit's guidance and direction for the people that you have in your church. Does that answer that question? Well, I'm just throwing garbage out there just because I can throw garbage. Because I want you to think for yourself. you got to be able to think, man. you got to be able to think. And you need to be saturated with the Word of God in order to do that off the top of your head. So let's get into another one. You have to do the Lord's Supper or communion nine times a year. True or false? Okay, is it a doctrine that will damn you to hell? No. So it's not a false teaching. It's just a misconception of Scripture because that is false. So how many times are you going to do it? My sister's church in Arizona, they do it every Sunday. Okay, so should we do it every Sunday? No. Why? Because we like to leadership to the side hop when we take the Lord's Supper. Show me the Scripture. I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love your open announcement. Church is too, they do it every service. Sunday That's right. Some do it every service. Some do it once a month. Some do it every three months. Some do it nine times a year. Some do it four times a year. That's closer about what we do, maybe three to four times a year. Um, but what is the stipulation? Does anybody know? What is it? Give me the scripture reference. First Corinthians chapter 11 um, talks about uh, the Lord's Supper. And Paul says, when you come together to do the Lord's Supper, as often as you do this. Well, there you go. As often as you do it. Well, well, whenever you want to do it, there you go. So now it becomes a church policy, a church as often as you want to do it. Some people love to do it every Sunday. I do not. I want the Lord's Supper to be something very, very special to me as I remember what the Lord Jesus did. And I don't want to do it every Sunday. Because it's going to be getting monotonous and it's going to be absolutely nothing after a while. And that's my opinion. And so as the leader of the church, and you guys have elected me and you trust me with that, we do it three to four times a year. Because I want it to be something very special to us. Does that make sense? And the people that do it every Sunday, they're allowed to do that as well. There's nothing unscriptural about it. All right. Hell is not a real place. That's false. Is that just my opinion? <laughs> Give me a scripture. Give me a scriptural reference. Did Jesus talk about hell? He talked about hell more than heaven, didn't he? <laughs> he did. Actually, he talked about money more than he did oh, heaven and hell. But he talked know. about hell more than he did heaven. <laughs> but you are right. You were right. Rich man and Lazarus? Okay. Luke 11? Excellent. What about uh, Matthew um, 10, 28, where Jesus says, don't fear the man that can destroy your body. Fear the one that can destroy your body and soul in hell. Right? Matthew 25, you remember the parable of the sheep and the, uh, the goat? Uh, uh, when he says, uh, they take the goats on the left hand, um, uh, cast them into hell that was prepared for the devil and his angels. Um, I said both New and Old Testament, Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, talks about um, the uh, 
um, the resurrection. Uh, some will be resurrected to eternal life, and others will be resurrected to eternal contempt. So Old and New Testament talked about a punishment. Now, it didn't literally sell, uh, say hell, because hell is a 13th century word. We didn't get the word hell till 13th century on. So it's not going to be in the Old Testament. It's not going to be in the New Testament, matter of fact. They use the word Hades and Shoal and uh, uh, Tartarus. So there's there's all kinds of different words we use. We just use that because everybody knows what that is. What does the get the, uh, they, don't, they don't believe in hell. They say grave or, uh, how is it? Yeah, they believe that one, if you don't go to heaven, you just go to grave. That's the end of it. Do you have any idea where they get that from? Yeah. They have. They've expanded that. Because they've reached more than 144,000. <laughs> So they said, those are the ones that are going to enjoy the earth. Everybody else is going to go to heaven and they're going to be, but those first 144 are special. Um, I don't know off the top of my head uh, any of those uh, special things, but um, I can't think. There's a few that suggest non-existence in the Bible, but you got to take the whole Bible in context. Um, because Isaiah and Jesus even quotes from Isaiah where he talks about the body will continually burn forever, where the worm doesn't die and the fire doesn't go out and all that stuff. So, no, it's an eternal punishment. And uh, take everything in context. But I can't think of the verse of what you're talking about, but I know what you mean. That's, uh, that's a good one. All right. Jesus said his body was broken for us. True or false? Is it a Okay, so Jesus said, this is my body which has been broken for you. Is that true or false? It's false. Okay, why? It's, it was a very, um, I think this thread that represents. Right. Well, Excellent. That's very good. I can't think of a word, but I don't know. So the Old Testament in Psalms said that not one bone would be broken. Jesus' body was not broken. But Jesus didn't say it, but actually it comes from uh, 1 Corinthians uh, eleven twenty four, where Paul says, as the Lord said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And just like Butch said, they had the flat bread and they would break it and it would be distributed to each person. So he's like, this is my body, which can be distributed to everybody, which has been broken for you. Not that his body was broken. But that's not a doctrine that's going to send you to hell. So it's not false teaching. It's a misinterpretation. Does that make sense? Excellent. Moving on. There's many paths to God. I'm aligning with Oprah Winfrey. No. There's no. There's not? What's the verse? John 7. John 14, 6. Excellent. John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes unto the Father except through me. Yeah, we're exclusivists. We're not inclusivists. Uh, unless you come to Jesus, you won't go to the Father. Uh, period. All right. We got time. Oh, we got time. Once you receive God's grace, you can go and live how you want. Yeah. You're eternally secure. It's But this one, I will tell you, is a false doctrine. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Because here's the danger of this. When you start telling people that they can accept Jesus and then go live how they want because they're eternally secure, they're not making a commitment to Christ. Because Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus. You know what Lord means? It means master. Master. Right? Repentance, change of mind. You're turning from sin and self, and you're trusting in a new master. You're having a change of direction. Now, all th this is the importance, and I want to tell everybody, this is the importance of works. Well, we don't work to get saved. That's correct. After you get saved, that is the reason that Jesus saved you. What does Ephesians 2 verse 10 say? Anybody know that one? You know 8 and 9. For by grace you saved through faith, not works of the same. What's verse 10 say? Come on, let's go. We're going to go to it. You're going to read it. I want you to see it, say it, read it. Come on. 
First one of Ephesians 2, verse 10, read it. Read it loud. Okay. We are created in Christ Jesus for good works. You are saved to go do good works. You're not saved by works, but you're saved to go do works. James says in James chapter 2, verse 24 through 26, See, you are justified not by faith only, but by works. How do you know you're saved? By what you do for the one that you say is your Lord. Amen? You go to Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. Jesus says, if you continue on till the end, you'll be saved. If you continue on to do this, if you continue following me, you'll be saved. If you continue on, you'll be... Listen, you can't go and live how you want to go. You've got a new master. You are a new creature in Christ. Everything, all things have passed away and everything now becomes brand new. You're a new creature. God's not going to let you just live the way you want. You're going to go do something for Jesus. He created you to go do good works for him. So if you do nothing for him, I would question your salvation. That is a false doctrine that may lead you to hell. Does that make sense? There's a lot of verses about the works, and, and that's why people get messed up. They're just like, oh, well, well, it's not works, it's grace. So I've got God's grace. Well, you better be working for him. Because if you don't, you might want to examine your life, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Right? Do you not know that Jesus is in you unless you're disqualified? What do you mean? How am I disqualified? What do you do for Jesus? Are you saturated with his word? Can you destroy arguments? Do you give? 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul says you give because you love Jesus. Do you give? Oh, you don't give nothing? Oh, you don't know anything about the Bible? You don't even know John 3, 16? Unsaved people know that one. You've never done, oh, you don't go to church? Oh, wow. Okay, you got to start somewhere. Hmm. Let's start back at salvation. We'll go that route. It's a very dangerous thing. That easy believism, I think a lot of people call it. Okay. Pastor. Yes. I grew up at Grace Bradley. Mary Avenue, and I said, when I was a kid, there was a split in the church, and they started the church of Mansfield, and that's what they believed. The church of Mansfield believed that they could, as long as they got saved, they could do good. Wow. Wow. I remember that. So, uh, let me ask you this question. we got a few minutes left. i got two questions left. May we get through. Speaking of church... Remind me of that when we get to the next question. The church service should be geared around unsaved people. True or false? False. Say so who said what? I believe false. You believe false. Anybody believe, agree with him? I believe that the purpose of people coming to church is to be fed and taught. Anybody agree with that? And there is a there is a need for salvation calls or so the uh, altar calls. Invitation. Yeah. But, Excellent. But that's yeah, that's what the teaching of these students. Can anybody give me a verse to back that up? A verse about not assembling, we're supposed to assemble. Okay, excellent. But tell me where a verse is where you talk about assembling the saved people. But still having something in there just in case some unsaved guy comes in. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 23. Paul says, if therefore the whole church comes together. Who is part of the church? The body of Christ, right? People that are saved. You are the body of Christ, which is the church. So when the whole church comes, when saved people come together in corporate worship, and he's talking about speaking in tongues and so forth, and he says, there be an outsider or an unbeliever come in. Yeah. So God expects when the whole church comes together that there's going to be some outsider or unsaved person come through the doors. We teach and we train up God's people in the way they should go to go give God glory out into the world. Just in case some unsaved person comes in, we have an altar call for them. Amen? That's why we build relationships. It's not about the service because this is geared around saved people. But that's why 1 uh, Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, 
says that we don't just give them the gospel, we pour our lives into them. So if they come in here, somebody has got to pick them up, man, and pour their life into them, to witness to them, get them saved, disciple them. It's that important. But yeah, uh, it's geared around saved people. All right, here's another question. Can anybody just start a church? Used to. <laughs> well, can you start it? Well, not, no, anybody can start a church according to the government. Let me yeah. just say a true biblical church. Can you start one? And I'll use Romans 10 verse 15. It says, uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And how can they hear unless uh, uh, they have a preacher? And how can they have a preacher unless somebody be sent? In every church that Paul sent somebody, he sent a letter of accommodation to accept this man into your fellowship. Accept him. He comes from me. I agree with this man. I'm giving you a letter. Accept him. Unless somebody be sent, unless this person be sent, we send out missionaries to other countries, and they are backed up by the authority of the church. When we baptize, I don't do it as much as I probably should, but I say, I now baptize you, my brother or sister. Under the authority of the church that has been given to me, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and Son. Why? Because under the authority of Scripture, you guys give me the authority to be in uh, the under-shepherd, under Christ, to lead you. So how can you start a new church without somebody being sent? So if someone decides to leave their church to start a church, but they're not sent from their church, is that biblical? That's my question. Let's just say... Like to say, somebody gets mad. Oh, we're just going to go start our own church. We're just going to believe the easy believism, and we, we just believe that you can just get saved and do whatever you want. We're just going to start our own church that teaches that. What, what if God calls them? Okay, would they go through a church? Well, is this just my opinion, or is this scriptural? You know, what are so I don't think that Aaron Cabin would have ever gone to Boston unless he felt the call of the Lord and that our church sent him. Okay. So what happened is, is you go to the scriptures that Paul talks about uh, and James talks about where he says, lay uh, hands on no man suddenly. And so you lay hands on men to do what? In most cases of ordination or sending them off to plant a church. Why are you doing that? Because we're saying... We're not saying that you're you're worthy. We're recognizing God's call right. for you to go and start a church. God called you, and we're recognizing his call. Yes. That's why we have ordinations, because we're not ordaining them. God ordains them, but we're recognizing that God is giving them. Yes, God is, is calling them to the ministry. So let's say this. Let's say somebody says, well, I believe God wants me to start a church, and they start a church. Let's say it's a woman. <laughs> so you go, okay, well, yeah, that's not going to happen. That's, that's not a scriptural church. Well, let me ask you this question. Let's say a husband and wife that don't know Jesus get saved under her ministry. Does that mean they're not saved? No. no. Wow. That's right. If you're saved, you're saved. Yeah, but you said something about a woman who teach under the authority of men. You do not say that. Yes. Well, what I'm saying is that she goes and starts her own church under her own authority. Yeah, she's the senior pastor, and she just she just said, I'm going to go start a church because I feel God lead me to. <laughs> and she has no church to back her up. But we do that because here's the thing. A lot of women in ministry uh, are are either not married or widowed. Wi widowed? No, wi what is it? Widowed. Widow is a guy. Right. Okay. So they go and they plant churches, right? Can they do that? Sure, why not? If they're under the authority of a church, they can go and get those established and set up. As long as when they are set up and men are discipled, that they can begin to lead the church. Right? Now, if a church is established and they just come up with their own thing, but then they have their own doctrine and then they become a Bible-believing church and then you got tons of people who are saved and part of the body of Christ, is that a recognizable church then? Not if the woman is the head of the 
Well, no, okay. Let's just, yeah, let's say she gets fired and some guy comes in. And <laughs> she passed she passes away. She, she passed away. And so her husband takes over or something. But, well, sure. So th there's nothing wrong with that because every church, and I want you to understand this, every church that exists is an extension of the day of Pentecost church. When the day of the church started, we are an extension of the Pentecost church. Ours didn't begin in the 50s. It began in AD 34, when Jesus died on the cross, rose again the third day, and the cloven tongues of fire come down 50 days after his resurrection. The day of Pentecost, our church started. We're just an extension of that original church. Does that make sense? Universal, I mean, that's the church universal. We are an individual entity. Our individual status started in the 50s, but yes, we were part of the original church. All right, that's good stuff. That's good stuff. Do you have to be ordained to be a pastor? I would say called by God. Should be. Okay, you don't that's have good. to be ordained. Jeez. No, you don't. The disciples, when Jesus sent them out, they weren't ordained. That's right. They were. They were that's right. They were common people. That's why when uh, Peter and John walked around doing some mighty works, and they were like, who are these guys? These guys must be drunk. They're unlearned. These guys are unlearned, ignorant people. But they spoke power because they spoke the word of God. And that's the importance of being saturated with it. All right. I hope you understand how important it is to understand the word of God so that you can destroy arguments. This is just a little fun thing that we can do. Mm -hmm. uh, so next week, we're going to talk about temptation. Uh, so let's close with a word of prayer, and we'll be done. Father, thank you for our time. Thank you for your word. I pray, God, that we would just get excited about being saturated with your word, destroying arguments, and just giving people hope that ask us of the hope that lies within us with meekness and fear. And so we pray, God, that you would uh, be with us, uh, that you would uh, just give us scenarios that we can come up with in our own mind to destroy arguments so that we can be saturated with your word and, and test ourselves from uh, time to time and one another so that we can... Uh, uh, Make sure that we have your word hidden in our hearts so that we may not sin against you. We love you, Lord, and uh, we just pray that you'd send us out the rest of this week, bring us back safe on Sunday, and uh, we just ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.